All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, day four's afternoon concurrent session of the ninth annual University of Maryland Symposium on Environmental Justice and Health Disparities. This conference is hosted by Dr. Shikobi Wilson, who is the director of the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. Uh, my name is Vivek Ravichandran, and I will be the moderator for this session. I'm currently an environmental health PhD candidate at the University of Maryland, and I've been involved with a plethora of air quality projects throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Today, we have an exciting um, session with a well-esteemed panelist today entitled Environmental Justice and Air Quality Monitoring Efforts in Turner Station. This particular session will take on the style of PowerPoint presentations, after which we will take a 50 to 20 minute Q&A from the audience that are listening live from YouTube as well as Facebook. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers in the order of which they will be uh, presenting today. First up, we have Ms. Gloria Nelson. Ms. Gloria has been the vice president and is now the president of the Turner Station Conservation Teams Incorporated for over 20 years. Um, under her leadership, the teams have accomplished many of the Turner Station uh, conservation plan objectives. These include beautification, safety, housing, infrastructure, etc. Gloria has also become a strong activist for legacy EJ issues impacting Turner Station, which is the largest historic African American community in Baltimore County, Maryland. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gloria, for joining us today as one of the community partners on this project. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Anna Rule. Dr. Rule is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's a director of the Exposure Assessment Laboratories there at her institution and is the director of the Pilot Projects Research Program of the Hopkins Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, we look forward to having you present as one of the academic partners of this partnership, Dr. Roll. Next up, we have one of our government partners, uh, Mr. Ryan Auville. Ryan is the manager of the Air Monitoring Program within the Air and Radiation Administration of the Maryland Department of the Environment. Um, at MDE, Ryan oversees the state's regulatory ambient air monitoring network, which is um, a network of stations that collect criteria air pollutant data for the main purpose of determining whether Maryland is in attainment of um, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, enforced by the EPA. Ryan has over two decades of experience in air quality monitoring, data management, and quality assurance that follow both state and federal regulations. And we look forward to hearing um, your presentation from a government lens, Ryan. And last, but uh, certainly not least, we're joined by Ms. Andrea Van Week. Um, as the Nature Conservancy's Baltimore Community Project Manager, Andrea strives to engage black and brown audiences appropriately and consciously and advocates for the application of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice principles within her realm of influence. She's focused on enabling equitable access to nature for communities of color, where she hopes fostering a connection to nature can serve as a tool to address trauma and nurture emotional, mental, and physical well being. Uh, thank you, Ms. Andrea, for joining us today as well. Um, I'm happy to have all of you on this panel, and I'm sure our audience. Um, watching virtually has a lot of questions and would love to be involved in the projects as well. So uh, without further ado, let's get right into the presentation series. Each presenter will have about 15 minutes to present and uh, my room monitor will make sure that we update you accordingly um, on the time limits. So uh, Ms. Gloria, you are the first to present. So I will go ahead. Um, Melissa, could you uh, just share your screen? Thank you. All right, Ms. Gloria, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Gloria Nelson, the president of the Turner Station Conservation Teams Community-Based Association. Next, please. I will share with you today an overview of our community history, the environmental justice priorities, our desired outcomes, as well as our challenges and changes and concerns. I'm gonna take you on a little journey. Next. Just as you could see, this is to give you a picturesque 
as to where we are, we, the Turner Station community, in proximity of a lot of industries that contribute to the pollution, decades of pollution. You will see to your right, we have the Port of Baltimore, and then we have um, BGE Station, and you see in the middle, we have Bear Creek, which was at that time designated as a Superfund site. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And you see Beth Steele. And over there, there's Gray's Lansfield. And we are just approximately right in the center there. Next, a little bit about our history. The Turner Station community is, is in the southeast corner of Baltimore County. We are a waterfront community in Dundalk, approximately two miles from the Spurs Point, directly across from Bear Creek. In 1888, Black people migrated from the South for jobs in Beth Steel and other industries. Turner Station then was founded and became the largest African-American community in Baltimore County. In 1920s through the 40s, due to, segregated, due to racial segregation, residents of Turner Station developed its own self-sufficient community. We did not have to leave our community for anything. We had grocery stores, post office, health centers, movie theaters, uh, drugs, uh, amusement park, you name it, we had it in Turner Station. In 1950, the community grew to over 10K and we were built on faith, family, hard work and education. Many successful people was raised in Turner Station just to share too. Henrietta Lacks, Hila Sales, and Councilman, Congressman Kwasi Fume, and you may recognize those two names. In 2001, Turner Station Conservation Teams, and as I mentioned, a community-based association, we were founded when our community conservation plan was created for revitalization. Currently, we have established a strong relationship of partners to help us improve and develop new homes, address EJ issues, improve infrastructure, beautifying the community, address public safety, as well as preserving our rich history. Next. Settlements remediation. Here we are, Beth Steele. That was our largest contributor to our pollution, decades of it. In the early 1900, Beth Steele was the world's largest steel mill company who employed over 30,000 workers. Steel was used for railroad creation as well as in the war production of World War I and II. In the 60s, things declined. The local demand led to decline in production. And as it led to decline in production with them as well as within our community. In 1997, EPA signed a consent decree with, with Beth Steel Corporation to address the environmental contamination on site. And boy, was it a lot. 2012, Beth Steel filed for bankruptcy and closed. And in between 2012 and 2014, there were several other companies that came and purchased the property, but they didn't stay around after they found out that they also um, had to inherit this consent decree that was there. So in 2014, Trade Point Atlantic, which is a multi-model logistic and industry center, inherits the consent decree. They have been doing a good job cleaning up as they have been redeveloping the, the property itself. They also have established a community advisory board, keeping the community well informed. They have such uh, industries on site, such as uh, Under Armour, Amazon, Home Depot, Volkswagen, McCormick, and it goes on and on. Next, please. Hazardous chemical control, Gray's Landfill, which, is, which was owned by Beth Steele as a disposal site for wastewater, blast furniture, furnace, waste, asbestos bearing waste. And also it was discovered that the site had begun to leach. So that became a problem and they had to line it to fix it. And can you imagine this leaching into uh, the Patapsico River? And it currently the site is owned by uh, Trade Point Atlantic. And I believe it's 141 
feet. Uh, the closure elevation is 141 feet. Next, please. Continue on with our hazardous chemical control. Honeywell in the Port of Baltimore. In 1970, filled material was used at the port of, at the Dundalk Marine Terminal that contained chromium. In 2006, EPA had a consent decree filed with the federal court in 2012. Now keep in mind all this time, the community had its involvement. And during this time, uh, Dunlop communities, which include Turner Station, worked with Honeywell to create a remediation plan. Why was Honeywell? Honeywell owned the property that the material was extracted from to be placed at Dunlop Marine Terminal. Uh, M MDE released a plan to address the chromium levels at the marine terminal and uh, associated with groundwater contamination from the storm drains. It actually ran into the various communities. And in 2020, realignment and repairs of the storm drain happened to prevent migration of chromium into the Patapsico River and groundwater. And we have been staying on that for, it's been well over 50 years, and we have been on that journey. Next, please. Not in my backyard, we said. We said that to that Virginia-based um, AES who wanted to build an 88-mile pipeline to um, Pennsylvania to pump gas out of state. And we said it, not in our backyard. And the purpose of the pipeline was to be, was to be located right in Beth Steel, two miles from Turner Station. And in 2008, Congressman Dutch Rubensberg, along with the Turner Station community, we requested Federal Emergency Regulation Commission, as well as the Coast Guard, to deny development of this site. And at four years later, finally, uh, in 2013, e AES abandoned the LNG site development. And boy, did we celebrate. Diesel pollution at the port of uh, Baltimore, Dunlock Marine Terminal. We was on this journey for the last six years. And in 2017, we participated in a diesel roundtable to consider how to reduce diesel e emission from the port of Baltimore activities. The trucks idled for hours along Bruin Highway. So the port is in actively trans positioning front to electric vehicles and trucks, as well as rerouting the truck traffic away from the community. They have done that, but trucks were still trying to take shortcuts from the Port of Baltimore to Spurs Point and in the reverse. So Baltimore County has recently, um, recently used cameras to monitor truck traffic to ensure that the trucks are not traveling under unauthorized areas. So, and just last year, EPA awarded Maryland Department of Environment $1.8 million to help reduce the diesel emission from the port of Baltimore. And what they have been doing is replacing the trucks and we have provided support letters to them for those efforts. Next, please. Settlement remediation. As you can recall, I mentioned Bear Creek and at the time it was that, that picture was taken, it was designated as a super, it was um, being proposed for a super fun site. It had actually been added to EPA national priorities list in 2022, and that was last year. We were very excited about those efforts with legacy of contamination for more than 100 years of discharge and hazardous, still making substance into the tributaries of uh, by Beth Steele. And a super fun engineering study results will be to now will be announced next month and it will be open for public comments as well as for cleanup methods so we are also excited about that and because of this legacy of pollution our community has had a high rate of of um heart disease lung disease respiratory diseases such as emphysema and asthma, and you can see the smokestacks there. It's real, folks. Next, flooding is one of our hugest priorities. And, and last year, 
the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did a study and they released the study. And what you see in these pictures are flood events that have been happening in the community. And we recognize that a lot of other community have flooding issues, but this is a, a huge issue and priority for our community. Next. So the results were, were released and from that study, it was suggested that we use great infrastructure as well as green infrastructure. The great infrastructure is very costly. It's probably will not happen in my lifetime, really, really cost. So we are focusing on um, the green infrastructure and we're working with Baltimore County. Uh, they have received a grant from Nit Nitwick Coastal Res Resiliency Grant to work on uh, a climate resiliency plan. So we're excited about that. And we, we're we using uh, planting trees and so forth to help with that. Next, please. Uh, Fleming Park is our shoreline restoration project. And just wanted to kind of give you a snapshot of that, that we have been working on that for the last five years. This project is currently on in pause, on pause uh, until we reconnect with Baltimore County to look at its footprint and think about the redesigning. But the conceptual concept of the project was to use innovative use of dredge material from the Baltimore Harbor. And the project will, if when going on, the project will thicken shoreline uh, protection from the community against storm drain as well as sea level rise. And it will certainly increase local um, regional capacity for risk management. And it is designed to include the community co-benefits. So we are still excited about that program, but as I mentioned, it's in pause. And just wanna share with you very quickly that uh, other concerns that we're in a food desert and we lack redevelopment. Turner Station is isolated geographically because of our location. So we have to think of alternative avenues to ensure that food security and access to services. We have a community garden. We also have one of the churches with a weekly food pantry, and then we do a monthly food distribution with the Maryland Food Bank. Getting to our air quality monitor, we are very excited to be working with the partners that's on this particular um, workshop session. And we were one of three communities that have been selected to participate with that grant. Um, and we, in Turner Station, our focus will be monitoring truck diesel traffic, dust, sound pollution, air pollution, as well as black carbon. And we have been working the next please. And as you'll see that we invited our partners out to our national night out event where it was very successful. This gave them an opportunity to share with the community. Uh, at that time, they recruited community residents participation of a community wide event. And that event again was our national night out. And where are we going from here? We'll be hosting community meetings to inform and update residents about this project. Our target audience are the churches as well as residents' homes. We're looking at monitoring Bruin Highway. When I mentioned to you previously, uh, Bruin Highway, where our interstate dumps into uh, that highway, which is right next to our community. So we're very excited about We had, um, uh, I don't know if you can really see the picture, but we had our uh, various uh, governmental folks. We had the community and we had University of Maryland with MDE and other partners here. So we really, really appreciate that. Okay, next is that our project outcomes are to improve quality of life for the Turner Station residents, to educate and inform them, build participation and involvement, as well as increased partnership, addressing systematic injustices. And I certainly our challenges as so many others have is funding. Funding is a big issue, as well as the project implementation timelines and schedules. When you're working with government, sometimes those timelines get, be, get to be, for, from our perspective, looking real unrealistic from the local government or state government it may be realistic for you. Thank you so very much for allowing me to take you on this journey. Thank you so much, Ms. Gloria, for walking us through, telling us a story about your community and really getting at all the cumulative um, burdens 
with the food deserts, air quality, et cetera. So uh, we're gonna save any questions for the end and we're gonna jump right into the next presentation by Dr. Anna Rule. So let me pull that up. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vivek, and, and thank you, Gloria, for, for being so patient with the, the many uh, hurdles that, that air sampling has. So, Vivek, I don't know if you can. I'm not sharing, so, so if you can put it on presentation mode. Right. Let me see if I can do that. Um, if, not, if, you, if you wanted to share, I can do that. Yeah, if you wanted to just share, it might be quicker. Um, So slides, whoops, uh, for whatever reason, this is different than the last time I tried it. <laughs> no worries, ma'am. Nope, I can't share this time. Oh my God. Present, because I don't stop screen, right? No. Slides from my computer here, okay. Uh, I don't know. Do I want to upload the file? Oh my goodness. Well, leave it. Maybe you need to do it. Um, <clears throat> can you share it as a PDF so I can just pull it up? I don't have it as a PDF. That's the problem. Wait, so... so. Oh, is this it? No. I was trying to share as it was, um, Andrea. I don't know what happened. Oops. There we go. I think it's up now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll um, I'll move through the slides for you. All right, thank you. And, and I'm gonna zoom through some of these because Gloria gave such a great introduction that I don't need to, I should I should just keep some of the, the first few so that I can leave enough time for, for everybody else. I just want to, to again thank um, Ms. Gloria Nelson and Larry Banderman from the Turner Station Conservation Teams that even though uh, Mr. Banderman is retired and not working with us, we still miss him a lot because yes. he was so, so helpful in all our, our uh, efforts. So next. Uh, the main focus of, our, of why Turner Station is exactly because of what Gloria just said. All of that industry surrounding the, the, the community. Next. And so our effort was actually centered around the Dondal Marine Terminal. By the time we, we were contacted with the community uh, in around 2010, uh, the, the, the consent decree was just getting started and there was a lot of, of, of uh, questions and, and anxiety about what was going to happen, who was going to be monitoring and, and how was that going to impact the, the air? Uh, because the area um, was paved, not capped. There's heavy traffic through there. And there had just been released a study by this uh, company, CH2M Hill, uh, that, that, that raised some concerns, uh, which I have in a, in a couple of slides. Next. And so the main concerns uh, for the Turner Station community, as, as Gloria mentioned, is, is uh, that the, about chromium-6, hexavalent chromium, um, we, which had been used as fill for the, for the marine terminal. Next. And so chromium is an interesting metal because it's one of the most useful metals for industry and for our daily lives. It has, it's very uh, resistant to tarnishing and, and has a high melting point. It's been, uh, has high corrosion resistance. So it's used for a lot of things um, in, in our daily lives, whether we, we know of it or not. So like chrome plating, wood preservation, le leather tanning, tanning. 
So when Baltimore was a, a chromium hub, there was a lot of, of uh, growth through the, through the region thanks to that. Unfortunately, some of the, the environmental um, concerns you know, kept accumulating over the years. Next. So chromium exists in two main forms. One we call trivalent form and the other one is the hexavalent. And the trivalent form is not absorbed by living organism, is mostly non-toxic to humans, is low solubility. So we don't worry about trivalent. We worry about hexavalent chromium because it's a potent oxidizer, inhalation carcinogen, very, very corrosive. A sensitizer has been linked to asthma uh, in, in people that work with chromium and it bioaccumulates in tissues. Next. And the problem is that they, are, they don't live by, by themselves as separate entities. Chrome 3 can become Chrome 6, and Chrome 6 can become Chrome 3. Initially, um, there was a thought that all of the Chrome 6 when put into the environment was going to just become Chromium 3 and stay like that. But we know now that in air, it reacts with ozone, with uh, some gases like sulfur dioxide, with manganese, with iron and arsenic in other particles in the air. And in water, it reacts with some manganese oxides and dissolved oxygen to also become like hexavalent chromium. And, and so, so this is our main concern, that it doesn't just stay as chromium-3 um, when we put it. Uh, and some of these reactions can happen while you're air sampling. So air sampling is very tricky to actually detect uh, hexavalent chromium. Next. And so some of the residue that was used as fill material for the marine terminal that Gloria was, was talking about. Um, as you can see here in the picture, the bottom part, this, this black area was called gray black copper, uh, is the product that originated from the Allied plant and was used as fill. And over the years, over the decades, it started to transform, as you can see in the part that is on the top here, the, the hard brown and what you see in the middle is this conspicuous yellow material, which is a very good telltale for hexavalent chromium. Next. So this, um, this, this uh, company, CH2M Hill, that, that was part of the consent decree, uh, they, they did a very extensive uh, study. And they found that actually the HB copper, the one that had been there the, the age chromium, the, the age material. So, so over time, it had actually been accumulating hexavalent chromium. It had been transforming from trivalent to hexavalent. And so when we, when my colleagues and I read these is when we first decided to go talk to the community to see if they had any concerns about the chromium. They of course had, they, they, they gave us some, some good uh, schooling in what was the problem with hexavalent chromium. And, and so we started to look into it. Uh, next. Uh, so this is just the, the part of the marine terminal that is filled with hexavalent chromium. Uh, and, and you can't see, but just off of Burning Highway, on the other side of this highway, uh, by, the, by the dark blue, that's Turner Station. So it's right there. And the dark blue is the, the, the chromium that is at the highest level, at the top of the field. Next. And so the, the marine terminal ex extension, like I said before, is largely paved but not capped and the heavy traffic. There's many potential areas for uh, aerosolizing these, these material that, that heals and comes to the top. Next. So what has been done, uh, also like, like Gloria already mentioned, uh, Honeywell on their consent decree collected some soil samples in the community adjacent to the terminal. Uh, it turns out that the Maryland Department of the Environment remediation level, at least at the time that we did that, the assessment, uh, it was 23 parts per million, and none of the samples were above this level. But when we were looking at other, um, other uh, states, the New Jersey Department of the Environment actually had a remediation level of 1 ppm, which is 23 times less than 23 ppm. And, and when we compared our samples or their samples to this uh, level, 17 out of the 36 samples were above the 1 ppm. And 8 of the 36 samples were above 2 ppm. So, so it, it was a little concerning because 
some at least some regulatory agencies were were considering these levels um, of concern. Next. So there was some air sampling at the marine terminal that is on the work zone perimeter. And it's really um, uh, the, the main objective of this sampling is for, for worker exposure. It's not really for community exposure, or at least at the time that we were doing the assessment. Uh, it's eight hour personal uh, time weighted average that is called. Uh, it's, it's used uh, one of the, the occupational methods, the NIOSH method for total particles. Um, and it, it, so air samples are collected and analyzed for that. Um, like I said, there's no community sample. Next, we can see the, some of the, the concerns is that the OSHA method has been shown to underestimate by up to 75% because of what, what I was saying about hexavalent chromium transforming to trivalent while you're sampling. Uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment was not monitoring, and I don't think is still at all in the community. The nearest site is Essex, which is about 10 miles away. And there's no chromium-6 sampling in Baltimore. Um, and, and Honeywell proposed five remediation actions, but um, and they decided to, to monitor, uh, to, to line the drains, which is what Gloria was talking about, which I think helped a lot. Um, but next. These are the... the samples that we collected the maryland department no uh the the, the honeywell does the the sampling and they have their uh their samples um uh reported to the mde so we we requested those samples and we plotted them you can see over the years they have been going down unfortunately that flat line that you see towards the end is the limit of detection so there's we cannot see if there's anything uh, higher or lower, but this limit of detection is at a relatively high increased risk for cancer uh, of one in 100,000. When really the EPA uh, most uh, conservative uh, recommendation is to be one in a million. So, so we know that this is a, a relatively high, although we don't know if it's lower because this is the limit of detection. So we don't know how low it, it can go. Uh, next. And so during the human health risk assessment that was done by CH2M Hill, they actually did say that there's no, no difference, no, no statistical significant variation in the monitored chromium-6 concentration uh, due to wind direction. So the, the source is there and, and it, it can potentially uh, stay, you know, as, as a source of, of the chromium-6. Um, the current site related air impacts on the marine terminal and off-site residents are insignificant that's what they they uh, concluded um, but there are implications and there is excess chromium-6 uh, just not due to the terminal so we don't know where that coming but remember the map that gloria originally showed the, the community surrounded by industry and at that time the sparrow spawns was was still active next so we collected some samples. I won't go into the details. Next, we analyzed uh, for, for hexavalent chromium. Uh, and, and you can go to the next one. Uh, we went to this, this uh, synchrotron uh, up in New York. It's a huge facility that, that, uh, that gives you access for a couple of days a month. And we analyzed the samples there. Next. And we did find, and this is this is what the, the sample analysis looks like, which is a little complicated to see, but those highlighted in red and, and orange are uh, where chromium is found in the filter. Next. And we compare some filters from, from Turner Station and some filters from 20 miles away. Uh, and this, for example, is a high hexavalent chromium uh, uh, spot. And so it's a very time consuming uh, effort. And after a ton of samples and a ton of analysis, next, we actually um, did find that, that the, the, there was excess hexavalent chromium in, in, in the Turner Station samples, but it was a very, very preliminary analysis, not enough filters. We applied for several uh, grants and we unfortunately were not successful. And uh, so what we have is that the, the knowledge that some of the 
total metals in, in the internal station in the air were higher than in the rest of Baltimore. And in the soil also, some of the samples were higher. And we presented these to the community maybe about eight years ago with the hope that we were going to get some funding to do to continue the analysis. But unfortunately, we, like I said, were not successful. So it, this is still pending. Sorry, sorry to, 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 to report. Next. Uh, and then some of the things that we have been finding over the years, uh, these are samples that, that were collected in 2005. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the, the EPA did this analysis and neither Baltimore nor New Jersey, Jersey City, are included in here, which we don't know why, because these are two cities that we know are high in, in chromium, uh, but we don't have any baseline. Next. And so, so these preliminary results show that the community air concentration are significantly higher than the other sites. Um, not, not for arsenic, that's not the case. Some of the soil samples, the concentration of arsenic and lead are higher in the community than in the control site. And, and some of the highest soil concentrations occurred in the topsoil. Uh, some of the results for, from that synchrotron analysis showed that that we have chromium in the samples but need to increase uh it, it was it was hard to make any conclusions um with so few samples so um next uh so baltimore is potentially one of the cities with highest concentrations of hexavalent and chromium uh due to historical and current sources there's unfortunately no monitoring and there it is necessary to have background and continuous monitoring in order to evaluate potential exposures so we need funds to continue the work and, um, and we are still find, trying to find some funds. Next. I just want to acknowledge and thank the Turner Station Conservation Teams, Ms. Gloria, Ms. La Mr. Larry, uh, and Steph, um, his wife, and Jana Mihalik, who, who helped us collect all of this uh, information and is still somewhere around there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rule, for the uh, very in-depth analysis. And for th through the first two presentations, I've heard a lot um, about MDE. And luckily for us, we have the manager of the air monitoring program from MDE who's going to present next. So, uh, Ryan, the floor is all yours. And I'm going to share. go ahead and share um, your presentation. OK. All right. Thanks for that. And actually, I think Ryan was actually one of my first contacts at MDE when we were trying to find a background site to do the comparison. <laughs> so thank you, Ryan. Did, did we, we did some sampling, right? Uh, I think at Old Town, right? Our Old Town site? In Old you... Town, yes, yes. Right, right, OK. OK, great. All right, like I've said, my name is Ryan Alville. I'm with the, the Maryland Department of the Environment's uh, Air Monitoring Program. and. I'm going to continue with the uh, environmental justice and air quality monitoring efforts uh, in Turner Station discussion, um, this time just focusing on the American Rescue Plan competitive grant. So next slide. So just a quick outline, just um, going through MDE's history in Turner Station. Um, we'll look at the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Um, we'll get more into some grant specifics for, for our project um, and then look at some air quality sensors that may be part of uh, this project moving forward. <clears throat> Next slide. All right, so um, well before the American Rescue Plan Act uh, came around, as Gloria and Anna have shared, MDE has, has been active um, in Turner Station. Um, the, the Maryland Interagency Work Group, which is a partnership that includes the Turner Station uh, Conservation Teams, MDE, uh, the Maryland Energy Association, as well as the Maryland Department of Transportation, um, has been working together, helping to initiate projects focused on reducing pollution, uh, improving air quality, and the overall environmental health in Turner Station um, and in other neighborhoods um, adjacent to the Port of Baltimore. Um, 
These projects have led to many changes over the years in and around the port uh, to include the creation of um, electro, electrical charging infrastructure at the port, um, the replacement of old inefficient diesel powered trucks with newer, uh, more fuel efficient ones, and even the replacement of some diesel powered uh, trucks, forklifts, and other cargo handling equipment uh, with electric models. As, as Gloria mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in the hopes of continuing to participate in these types of improvements in, in overburdened communities, uh, MDE developed a, a draft narrative and work plan for the American Rescue Plan competitive grant. Um, so back in spring of 2021, uh, Congress allocated $100 million to address health outcome disparities from pollution and the COVID-19 pandemic. Of that 100 million, 20 million went to funding competitive grants to enhance air quality monitoring in and near underserved communities, as well as to produce air quality partnerships between communities, um, local governments, and states. Um, so, so in March of 2020, 2022, MDE applied for this competitive grant uh, with support from the Turner Station conservation teams uh, and two other community associations, one in Curtis Bay and one in Chevrolet, um, as well as assistance from the University of Maryland and SIEGE, uh, the Center for Community Engagement and Environmental Justice and Health, as well as the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences um, and uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health with a project title of Community Partnership Program to Monitor and Mitigate Cumulative Air Pollution. So this, this was an extremely popular grant. Um, EPA, received, uh, or EPA received over 200, or 200 applications uh, for these funds uh, from anyone from community groups to nonprofits, government agencies, as well as tribes. Applications were reviewed and evaluated on several criteria, including community involvement, um, environmental justice and environmental results, uh, quality assurance, uh, programmatic capability, budget, and overall project uh, approach. Uh, because EPA received so many applications, um, they decided to use some of the funds from the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act to supplement the ARP competitive grant. Um, in doing so, they doubled the original amount of money set aside for this grant. So with that, EPA was able to fund 132 of these projects. Thankfully, uh, one of the ones approved uh, was the grant application that MDE and all of its partners uh, put together. Next slide, please. So just, just uh, um, a few more specifics. So the main objective of, of, of our grant um, is to identify and implement air pollution exposure and risk reduction measures based on community recommendations and data from multi-pollutant air sensor super sites in three underserved and overburdened communities. So Gloria mentioned this as well, the, the three communities, obviously Turner Station uh, and Chevrolet and um, in uh, Curtis Bay. So the, the, there will be a fourth community as well. Um, the location hasn't been determined just yet, um, but we're gonna use an area with far fewer potential sources of pollution um, for comparison purposes to the three overburdened and underserved communities of Turner Station, Chevrolet and Curtis Bay. So um, the overall grant timeline is two years. So we just received um, the funds in, in June of, um, of this year. So, um, so we'll go two years out from there. So this grant will run um, into June of 2025. So we're just in the first phase, currently um, having steering committee meetings, uh, determining community needs, developing a quality assurance project plan or QWAP. Um, we're, pretty close to um, picking out sensors and then uh, we'll get those purchased and, and eventually deployed, um, as well as working with community engagement, partnership and, and training. Uh, 
that piece of the grant, uh, that, that's really being led by the community groups as well as the University of Maryland. Um, in phase two, that's when um, data starts to be collected and, and we jump into the analysis side of things, um, uh, leading to cumulative impact analysis, uh, air pollution mitigation, uh, eventually summarizing the findings and, and developing next steps uh, in, a, in a written report. Um, some of our official outcomes um, are increased knowledge and awareness in terms of air quality and overburdened communities, uh, determining mitigation measures, plans, and policies with a goal of uh, leading to long-term reductions in air pollution and improved health outcomes for these communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, for much of 2023, the project partners have been uh, um, having periodic steering committee calls led by the University of Maryland uh, to determine specific monitoring needs. So questions that we've been asking are, are what are the community concerns and what specific air pollutants could be measured to address those concerns? Um, and, and then what monitoring locations could be used to best fit uh, the concerns of the overall, um, best fit the concerns and overall project objectives. So here's uh, just a few uh, examples of pictures of um, sensors that, that might be used and, and some of them probably will be used um, as part of the project. Um, the pollutants that we're looking at, and, and Glory mentioned a few of these as well, black carbon, uh, PM 2.5, and NPM 10, um, we're looking at um, gases, possibly ozone, CO, and NO2. We're trying to uh, get a total VOC sensor. Um, and obviously we want to have meteorology as part of that. So when we do see values, concentrations um, that are elevated or, or short-term spikes, um, long-term spikes, um, we're gonna use the meteorology to kind of determine okay, where are these sources and, you know, where is this pollution coming from? So um, these pictures to the top left there is a, is a black carbon sensor that we, we will be using um, as part of the, part of the grant. Um, in the middle on the bottom there is, a, is an example of a total VOC sensor. This actually sits on a tripod um, and it has, a, um, it has a MET sensor on the top so we can use that to kind of figure out where the pollution sources uh, are. Um, and then on the right is a, is, is a sensor that uh, does both PM and gases and meteorology. Um, it's on a, the top of a street sign there. Uh, but those are just a few examples of, of kind of what we're looking at and, uh, and hoping to get purchased fairly soon. Uh, next slide. Well, that, that was it. I think we're going to hold questions until the end, but I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Megan Ulrich, uh, Assistant Air Director in the Air and Radiation Administration, and uh, Tim Shepard, Division Chief, uh, Mobile Sources Control Pro Program, uh, also in Aura. And um, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, Bebeck, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thanks, Ryan, for talking about the, uh, the grant and some of the specific sensors. You mentioned the VOC sensor, and we did have a speaker, um, I think, on Monday present on these sensitive instruments as well. So looking forward to leveraging that um, into the, the purchases. But uh, so now we're going to move on to our final speaker, um, Andrea, that would be you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share your presentation. Thank you, Vivek. So I'm going to be providing an overview of the climate and social resiliency effort the Nature Conservancy is facilitating for the Toronto Station community, where we're taking a resident-centered approach to implement equitable conservation. Just a little background on my organization. Uh, the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends, where our vision is a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our needs and enrich our lives. Next slide, please. So within the, 
the Nature Conservancy, I'm a part of the Baltimore program, which was established in October of 2021. And this slide is basically serving as a visual representation of our seven year strategic plan through 2030. Our work in Turner Station has been baked into this plan and falls under the enable equitable access to nature strategy where we're seeking to build trust, enhance community capacity, and grow community power to ensure Turner Station sustainability and longevity as a community on the front lines of the climate crisis. As a global environmental nonprofit, um, our program is really pushing for the work to serve as a model for how the Nature Conservancy's extensive resources and networks can be leveraged to support boots on the ground restoration and conservation work. Next slide, please. So this is just providing an overall um, uh, snapshot of the project timeline. Um, as you can see, Witness Trees is a multi-phase project where we're investing our time and financial resources to support Turner Stations in their equitable conservation journey. We wrapped up phase one of the work, which is uh, based on uh, building trust uh, in November of last year. We're currently working through, and we extended it actually to November of 2023, um, uh, enhancing community capacity for phase two. Phase three is focused on growing community power and that will run through May of 2025. And phase four is to curate a resiliency plan for Turner Station, which will be completed by December of 2024. Next slide, please. At this time, I'm gonna go through each phase and provide some additional information. So for phase one, again, again, the goal there is to build trust and the mechanism that we're using to do so is, um, or past tense, what we did do was convene and engage uh, community residents in the design development and finalization of a tree planting and public art installation. As a guiding light for the development of this design, um, the project had the following goals, which were curated by Turner Station conservation teams. The first of which was to preserve the community's rich cultural history. So how can we share stories of the past through the tree planting design and the additional public art? The second was to celebrate community resiliency. So how can we speak to Turner Station sustainability and longevity over time? And the third is to enhance climate adaptation, environmental health, and public health. So how can we ensure the well-being of the community despite challenges such as climate change um, and industry that has and continues to impact their air quality and water quality and overall well-being? Next slide, please. So for this project, we selected two locations for the tree planting and public art installations. We wanted to select locations that represented where people live and worship in Turner Station. Um, the first of which was Lion Homes, also known as the Henrietta Lacks Village. This provides affordable housing to residents and is actually adjacent to Broning Highway, which is the throughway for Dundalk Marine Terminal and truck traffic. And therefore, the planting of these trees at this location can support improved air quality. And the second location was at Union Baptist Church, which is the oldest church in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So in the summer of 2022, the Nature Conservancy facilitated a community visioning workshop series for residents to offer their interests and preferences on the project design for both site locations. As a part of that visioning series, we also interviewed residents on their experience growing up in Turner Station, their hopes for the witness trees, and then also the future of the community. Next slide. And so our approach for this restoration project was a community, excuse me, a human centered design where residents would not only feel connected to nature, but connected to um, people and storytelling. What surfaced during these uh, community design workshops and resident interviews was what our design consultant um, claimed as the tree of life theme, where the witness tree roots represent the community's past, the branches represent the present and the leaves the future. And then also by incorporating successional planting, we've got the canopy trees uh, that represent the historic figures and community elders of Turner Station with the younger understory trees representing the youth and future leaders of the community. Next slide. So in November of 2022, we hosted a community dedication day to celebrate the partnership of Turner Station stakeholders and residents, as well as the official planting and installation of the witness trees. 
Ultimately, we planted about 140 trees and installed 12 public art pieces, which are pictured here um, on the slide, uh, our signposts that were categorized by specific community themes that kind of came up during the visioning series. And we also, they include um, actual quotes from the resident interviews. So one of my favorite quotes um, is, as humans, we have the ability to create for ourselves areas of peace and refuge, a place where love is felt. Next slide, please. So for phase two of Witness Trees, the goal again is to enhance, enhance community um, capacity. We're doing this by facilitating a three-year strategic plan to prioritize Toronto Station's needs and interests, as well as grow the next generation of leaders to take on the work moving forward. Next slide. This just talks about the approach um, on the behalf of our community development consultants and what they've basically been doing over the past several months to ensure that the strategic plan is community owned and equity centered. Just to highlight some, some efforts, we're making sure that we're having a co-creative and inclusive process, that we're incorporating collective action and shared responsibility and prioritizing relationship and network building. Next slide. To ensure community voice is uplifted in this plan, we've taken a laid approach to community engagement as can be seen here. Um, our kind of main powerhouse of coordinating is being done by a coordination team, which consists of community co-chairs, the Turner Station Conservation Team board members, um, our facilitators and the Nature Conservancy, and we're kind of managing the overall process. The next level up is the Turner Station Conservation Team's board and their extended members that are guiding the development of the plan and ensuring engagement of fellow partners. And then we've got uh, what we're calling the Visioning Committee. They serve as additional community stakeholders to inform the strategic plan with the incorporation of community member perspective wherever possible to help refinement of the strategic plan. Next slide. Phase three of the work is uh, dedicated to growing community power. Next slide. And this phase will be dedicated to youth stewardship and storytelling. So what we're seeking to do is facilitate environmental experiential programming to connect youth to place, as well as opportunities for them to share their story in hopes of inspiring not only themselves, but others in the community, as well as incorporating stewardship of the trees that were planted in phase one of the work um, with allowing the opportunity for additional tree plantings in phase three. Next slide. And then phase four is dedicated to climate, uh, developing a climate resiliency plan. Next slide. And this has been led by Baltimore County. Um, this is an effort to support flood management in the community, which Ms. Gloria had mentioned is a huge problem for Turner Station. Um, this work really uh, was built based off of the US Army Corps of Engineers flood resiliency study that was um, shared or implemented in 2022. The county then uh, took that information and applied for additional funding to address this issue. And the plan is going to focus on green infrastructure opportunities um, based on flood area concerns in the community, as well as community interests for greening. Ultimately, the community will have mapped out flood, uh, will have a mapped out flood management plan with suggested projects that are ready for additional fundraising efforts, of which TNC will be happy to support that work. And that's it for me. All right, Andrea, thank you so much. And I really um, loved the conceptual framework that you presented as well. And I think it's a really great uh, note to end on. I wanna thank all the panelists for their presentations. I see that, um, let me check the private chat. Okay, so we have about uh, 13 or so minutes for questions. So um, <clears throat> those of you who are watching on the YouTube live stream, go ahead and um, ask away in the chat and then we'll kind of pop up your question onto the screen and then we'll allow each of our speakers to address it. So we'll go ahead and give that about a minute.
Um, but while the chat's sort of populating, um, I did have a quick question for you, Ms. Glory. I, I guess, well, more so I want you to elaborate on some challenges you might have faced. I know we talked a lot about successes and what sort of lies ahead, but what are some challenges um, you might have faced in terms of uh, seeking environmental justice and maybe even proactiveness from, say, legislators and the polluting facilities in your community alike? Um, and you can answer that however comfortable you feel answering doing so. Okay. Thank you so much. The biggest thing is funding, it's getting the money to, um, to help mediate the issues. We, we, have had, we have been successful working with our partners of those industries that surrounds the community. And it could be so much that uh, they know that we are a very active and strong association and that we're not leaving the table. So we're at the table with every issue or concern that we feel impacts the residents of the community. Um, but our, our biggest concerns right now is the way in the food desert, you know, and that does lead to health issues. So how can you be healthy and breathe great air when there's no, no grocery store around? And then the other biggest thing, as you saw, was is flooding. The challenges was flooding. Uh, fortunately enough, you know, finally, we're working with those partners around this table um, as in a Baltimore County. Uh, so again, we have some funding to get started, but we was so much need additional funding. So that is our, our biggest uh, concern is the funding to implement some of the things from the study from the uh, Maryland Corps, U.S. Corps, uh, Army Corps of Engineer and others. Thanks for that. You definitely mentioned um, the cumulative exposures and burdens as well with food deserts, the air pollution. And we do have sessions on um, Tic Tac, so that's the Thriving Communities and Technical Assistance Program. And this region, um, I believe our center is was the recipient along with the National Wildlife Federation and other entities. Mm -hmm. So we're having certain community-based organizations serve as community hubs to help uh, reallocate that funding to the communities that need them. So. Hopefully you might have a chance to listen in or watch those recordings of the Tic Tac session um, after the symposium. But thank, thank you for that, Ms. Gloria. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, so we, we could end a couple minutes early if there's nothing else from our viewers online. And, but before we do so, I did want to mention that we do have for, this, for our speakers, as well as the audience members, a third concurrent series after this. So again, our agenda is available on our website. Feel free to drop in um, to the session of your choice. And we do have a close in plenary as well. Um, that close in plenary is on environmental justice and economic empowerment, a financial roundtable on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Mm -hmm. And that is specific, I believe, to the um, state of Maryland. So super exciting. And again, thank you. Oh, was that Dr. Do you have, do you have the, the link so that if, if we don't have the link, can you put it on the chat? Yep, um, I can do that right before we close. I'll put the link to our um, agenda. But before I do that, I wanna thank all our speakers, our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Ms. Gloria, for participating, yeah. especially as our community partner. Thank you, um, Ryan, for representing MDE, Dr. Rule for representing Johns Hopkins University, our academic partners, and thank you, Ms. Andrea, as well. Um, so yeah, let me put the link to the agenda in the chat, and then we can, we can close the room.